From Wondery, I'm Mark Ramsey, and this is part four of Inside Psycho. July 2016, France. In a bright and vibrant corner of Paris sits the Cinémathèque Française, home to one of the largest collections of film-related objects in the world. It was not his first time in Paris, not by any stretch, but it was his first time in this museum. He wanted to reunite with an old friend, Through a dark, dank hall he walked. The dim lights and moisture controls protect thousands of -of one-of-a-kind items. He stepped into a gallery and stopped, cold. Before him, encased in bulletproof glass, under the beam of a spotlight, was the desiccated corpse of a woman aged 40, poisoned with strychnine, by her son, Norman. He stared into the empty eye sockets and smiled. He was Jerry Mathers. Fans of classic TV know him better as the Beaver. See, in 1960, Jerry was a kid shooting Leave it to Beaver at Universal. The show's makeup man, Bob Dawn, was working on the other side of the lot on a super secret movie under the direction of Alfred Hitchcock. One day, Bob brought a skull to the set. He had to age it and glue hair onto it to make it look like the corpse of Norman Bates' mother. One hair strand at a time. It was slow, painstaking work. Can I help? Jerry asked. Sure, kid. And so, for several days, young Theodore Cleaver was the envy of every 12-year-old boy. He spent his off-camera time gluing hairs to the most famous corpse in cinema history. It started innocently enough. Alfred Hitchcock sat in the very back row of the movie theater. It was an advanced screening for Psycho, and it was a full house. He moved nervously in his seat. His forehead was matted with sweat. Except for the sound from the screen, the audience was silent. Dead silent. Not a scream, not a gasp, not a cough. Dead silence. Only the sound of his own breathing. The climax came The climax went. Nothing. Hitchcock lifted himself to his feet and walked out of the theater. Stricken with panic, he found himself on a beach. Behind him, the film was over and the theater doors swung open. The audience poured out. But how how could he have not noticed before. Every person in the audience was wearing a prim, modest, full-length gray dress. Every person had gray hair wrapped in a bun. Every person held high a kitchen knife. They were swarming and heading right for him. He stood petrified as the throng ran past him. Wave after wave, they ran down to the water's edge. Wave after wave, they ran into the water. They were drowning themselves, every one. Hitchcock watched, frozen in space. He pinched himself. He felt nothing. Pinch, 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 pinch. What? What time is it? It was 8 a.m., His driver was at the door. Time to take him to Universal. 
another day of shooting on Psycho. That's the sound of a graphic artist at work. 39-year-old Saul Bass was a regular Hitchcock contributor. He had already made a name for himself as the guy who creates title credits for movies which were better than many of the movies themselves. Indeed, nobody in Hollywood realized that opening and closing credits could enhance the experience of the movie until Saul Bass came along. His long career would include not only scores of title credits, but also corporate logos and movie posters. An early version of today's AT&T logo was his work. So was the poster for The Shining. For Hitch, Saul had worked on titles for Vertigo and North by Northwest, and now he was hard at work on Psycho. Not just on title sequences, but on storyboards for key scenes, including the shower scene. Saul wanted to storyboard that sequence in flashes, a rampage of images where the editing created the action. This was new to Hitchcock, and he was not comfortable with the approach. But Saul produced a test, and Hitch was convinced. I'm going to shoot and cut it staccato so the audience won't know what the hell is going on. That was Hitchcock. So Saul set out to design each of the 77 different shots in the shower sequence. Once filmed and edited, the sequence was, as Hitchcock biographer Stephen Ribello puts it, a masterstroke. Hitchcock simultaneously succeeded in titillating and shocking the viewer while concealing the nudity of the victim and the true identity of the attacker. Now, we're used to flash cuts today, but what Bass and Hitchcock created was new in 1960, and it would prove extraordinarily unsettling to audiences forevermore. Saul Bass. I had a purest notion of making a horrible murder with no blood. It struck me as a nice thing to do. Nice. And definitely more sensor-friendly Maybe. Quiet on the set. Ah, a warm, relaxing, soothing shower. Just surrender to it. It washes away the grime of the day. It washes away the sins of the past. At least, that's how it used to work before Psycho. Janet Lee famously said she never took another shower in her life after Psycho. Shooting was scheduled for the week of December 17 to the 23rd. Twas the week before Christmas. The set was ready. Blinding white tiles, brilliant chrome fixtures. The scene was intricately storyboarded, nothing left to chance. The scene was weeks in the making. Hitchcock conference with Janet Lee. Janet, I'd like you to do the scene in the nude. No. Well, how about for the European version? No. Well... That's not quite how Janet Lee remembers it, and no amount of nudity would have passed the censors, so I think Janet is telling the truth when she says it was all suggestion. Suggestion and a whole lot of flesh-toned moleskin fabric glued over both of Janet's breasts and, as she put it, the vital part. Take 10. Cue the shower. Action. The water runs and the fabric peels away. Cut. In rushes the costumer to put Janet's modesty back together again. Take 20. Cue the shower. Action. More water, more peeling, more modesty revealed, more moleskin, more glue. And so it went for seven days. But Hitchcock needed coverage, no pun intended. And for that, he needed a Janet Lee stand-in, someone whose job was to be naked on set all day. Hitch needed what he called a nudist. 
That nudist was Marley Renfro, a 23-year-old model and Vegas dancer who, in September of 1960, the month of Psycho's release, would grace the cover of Playboy. Some of the skin in the shower scene is hers. To Janet Lee's great relief. There's no real nudity in the sequence, however, and the knife never even penetrates the body. But wait. Take a closer look. If you view the film frame by frame, there is a fleeting glimpse of a nipple and a clear image of the knife's tip disappearing into a body. And whose hand was it stabbing away at Janet Lee? Why... Alfred Hitchcock's, of course. Later, a variety reporter asked Hitchcock whether the sheer sensationalism of the sequence would bring down the wrath of the censors on him. He answered, Well, men do kill nude women, you know. At the end of the scene, Janet Lee had to lay perfectly still, collapsed on the bathroom floor, holding her breath and staring dead eyes open at the camera. This went on for hours. Cut! Print it! By now the steam had completely peeled away the fabric covering Janet's breasts, but she was beyond modesty. At that point, with that shot, I didn't give a damn, she said. Back in the screening room, Hitchcock shared the footage with his wife and collaborator, Alma. She looked closely at the final scene, Janet's dead stare at the camera. She blinked, Alma said. What? That's not possible. We viewed this footage a hundred times. No, 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 she blinked. Alma was right. Out came the blink. In went a freeze shot. Blink proof, Hitchcock said. There was a stain on the face of one of the production assistants, right around his mouth. Have you been tasting the blood? That's what Hitchcock asked. It wasn't a red stain, but a brown one. That's because the blood spiraling down the drain at the conclusion of the shower sequence was actually chocolate syrup. Bosco chocolate syrup, to be exact, a product that's still sold today. The company describes its flagship product as the thickest and richest chocolate syrup, all natural and fortified with B vitamins, goes great with ice cream, milk, coffee, and more. More evidently includes classic stabbing sequences. What does it sound like to stab a human being? Hitchcock puzzled over that one. He had the action down, but but not the sound. Find me a watermelon to stab. When Mr. Hitchcock tells you to go find a watermelon, you go find a watermelon. But Hitchcock's notorious perfectionism was well known to his crew. One watermelon would not do. No, no, no. Hitch would need a farmer's market of fruits and vegetables to sacrifice to the movie gods. And a farmer's market of fruits and vegetables is exactly what the prop man provided. There it is, on the table, a glistening cornucopia of fruits and vegetables. Melons, lettuce heads, a pineapple, a coconut, and a variety of other produce that defied easy identification. Let's start at one end and go to the other. That's a production assistant, the one with the knife. Hitchcock stood back silently and closed his eyes. He was going to feel the sound of the stab. Cantaloupe. Honeydew. Cassaba. Coconut. Pineapple. And so it went. That's all I have, Mr. Hitchcock. The big man paused, then opened his eyes. Cassaba he said. Speaking of sounds, there was the sound 
of the toilet. You probably don't even remember the toilet in Psycho. It was in the bathroom where Marion is murdered. She tears up the incriminating piece of paper which shows how much money she had stolen, and she flushes it down the toilet. But here's the thing. There had never been a toilet seen in a movie before, let alone one flushing. Yeah, the censors don't allow that. Well, I'm going to have to fight for it, Hitchcock said. Think about that. This was an era when just the sight of a toilet was viewed as too shocking for delicate audience sensibilities. It was only going to get worse from there. That's Janet Lee screaming. She just opened the door to the 1957 Ford Custom 300 sedan her character made famous in Psycho, and there in the passenger seat was the corpse of Norman Bates' mother. See, Janet was really easy to scare, and Hitch had to figure out which model of mother was scariest. There were several different faux cadavers in the running. How to choose the winner? It was an opportunity too tempting to give up. Janet would provide what Hitch called the decibel test. May the best corpse win. Mr. Hitchcock wants to see you. Janet creaks open the door to Hitch's office at Universal. Yes, it's mother's corpse behind the desk. Lunch. Time to visit the craft service table. Hey, Janet, uh, can you grab me a, a chicken wing from under that cover? Yep, mother's head. And then there was the time that Janet had to pit stop in her trailer before a big scene, just a touch-up in the bathroom. Hitch and company were just outside the trailer, waiting. We have a winner. That was Hitchcock, lighting up his most satisfying cigar of the day. October 30, 1938. Benny had been a child prodigy and a Juilliard graduate. He was on staff at the Columbia Broadcasting System. His job was to write the music for radio dramas. In those days, the music, the entire broadcast, was performed live. This particular night was the eve of Halloween. And Benny's collaborator on that night's show was an impetuous, egotistical, ferociously talented 23-year-old Broadway and radio star named Orson Welles. Welles' show, the Mercury Theater on the Air, was hardly the most listened to. After all, its prime competition was Edgar Bergen and a ventriloquist dummy named Charlie McCarthy. And who didn't want to hear a ventriloquist on the radio? This night was different, however. War of the Worlds terrified the nation. And it made Orson Welles a star. When Welles got to Hollywood, he needed an experienced composer to help him with his ambitious first picture, Citizen Kane. Come on out, Welles said to Benny. And that's how young Bernard Herrmann came to Hollywood. He would continue to score movies for 35 years, finishing off with Taxi Driver in 1976. And between his collaborations with Orson Welles and Martin Scorsese was perhaps his most famous partnership of all, the one with Alfred Hitchcock. Benny had scored several Hitchcock films already. Hitch knew talent, and Benny had it. I have the final say, or I don't do the music, Benny said. Hitchcock is very sensitive. He leaves me alone. Hitchcock was a stickler, for music and sound effects. If you've ever seen a tense and exciting scene with the sound turned off, you know why. Action, dialogue, sound, and music, they all work together to create an effect. In the famous shower scene, Hitchcock made a dramatic creative decision to use no music whatsoever. He said, throughout the killing, there should be shower noise and the blows of the knife. We should hear the water gurgling down the drain of the bathtub, especially when we go close on it. During the murder, the sound of the shower should be continuous and monotonous, only broken by the screams of Marion. 
Well, as you know, the scene didn't work out that way. It was not silent. In fact, there were several sequences where Hitch specified no music. But Hitchcock was nervous. He did not trust himself. So Benny countered with some ideas of his own. How about if I only use strings? Only strings, nothing else? Only strings for the entire score? Only strings. That unique effect was what Hitchcock biographer Stephen Rebello called a cello and violin masterwork. Black and white music that throbbed sonorously as often as it gnawed at the nerve endings. January 17, 1960. Hitchcock nervously takes his seat in the screening room. He's about to watch the shower sequence for the first time with music. Benny sits at his side, infinitely more comfortable in his own skin. The lights go down, up comes the picture, and the sound of Bernard Herrmann's screaming violins. Three minutes later, the lights come up. All eyes were on Hitchcock. He silently rolled the cigar around in his fingers. Silence was often Hitch's most dramatic effect. Benny, Hitchcock said, you just saved my picture. Forever after, Hitchcock would say 33% of the effect of Psycho was due to the music. The music Hitchcock never wanted. February 1, 1960. Hitchcock and crew had just filmed the very last scene of Psycho. The movie was only nine days over its tight shooting schedule. Post-production was still ahead, but the director's favorite actors on the picture, Tony Perkins, Martin Balsam, and Janet Leigh, had all moved on to other projects. In a very real sense, Psycho was over. Still, he felt something was wrong, very wrong, and Hitchcock was terrified. In his office at Universal, he paced back and forth, sighing, chain-smoking. It's awful, he told himself. What I've just made is awful. Maybe, just maybe, he could cut the film down for his television show. Yes, he really considered transforming Psycho into just another chapter in his TV series. His wife and partner, Alma, tried to calm him down. You have something here, something great, she told him. Maybe, but would audiences ever accept it? And before Psycho ever reached an audience, the movie had to do battle against a foe even more formidable than box office expectations. Psycho had to fight the censors. And for a while there, it looked like Psycho and Alfred Hitchcock would lose. Next time on Inside Psycho. From Wondery, this is a six-part deep dive inspired by the story behind an unforgettable classic movie. This is part four of Inside Psycho. We'd like to learn more about you. Please complete a short survey at wondery.com survey and subscribe to the show on iTunes, Stitcher, the Wondery app on Android, or wherever you listen. It's free. For more information and to comment on this show, visit our website, wondery.com slash Inside Psycho. If you like the show, we'd love you to give us a five-star rating and a review. It helps others go Inside Psycho 2. Written and narrated by Mark Ramsey. Sound design and editing by Jeff Schmidt. Produced by Mark Ramsey Media. Executive producers Jeffrey Glazer and Hernan Lopez for Wondering. 
please thank us by rewarding our sponsors with your support. Tell your friends about this show. And mother, thanks you. <laughs>